Welcome to the Art of Humanity. I'm your host, Jessica Ann. This is my podcast where you can listen for fresh perspectives with artists, leaders, authors, and your favorite entrepreneurs. You can explore creativity and consciousness, evolve your business with the Art of Humanity. Now, here's this week's episode. Hey, it's Jessica Ann, and we're back with this new season of The Art of Humanity. Welcome to episode 67, and this guest is the perfect time for this moment in history. We are entering a time where we need to let go of the urge to be quote-unquote right all of the time. We are completing karma and letting go of multiple timelines right now. The thing is, we don't need to be doing things a certain way or holding back any parts of ourselves for fear of being ostracized or rejected or judged. We are in this new paradigm where these energies reveal what we unconsciously believed in to fit in. But now we can question whether we need to keep doing certain things to fit in. We don't have to fit into a mold or a cookie cutter way to thrive in today's world. We no longer have to latch on to organizations. The thing is, we are really being gifted right now to look at themes of where we place our energy in other structures, whether that's in organizations or religions, and whether we do so to the point of sacrificing our individuality. This is a release of man-made dogma, and these are huge, huge themes. These are shifts that may not make sense logically, but it really supports this rebirth and this collective energy that's moving within us it's really important to listen to what it's saying. And while I'm speaking in terms of energies and certain planetary influences here, I really think it's important to bring in today's guest who can shine a light on the more intellectual side of these energies. In this episode, we talk about many different things. And as you listen, I invite you to see my guest's ideas as a kind of code to think in multidimensional ways so that we can resonate on more abstract topics, which requires us to grasp some pretty far out concepts that emphasize growth in cognitive complexity. Have you heard of the Buddhist parable of the blind man and the elephant? It's a really rad story. Here it goes. A group of blind men heard that a strange animal called an elephant had been brought to the town, but none of them were aware of its shape and form. So out of curiosity, they said, we must inspect and know it by touch of which we are capable. So when they found it, they groped it. And the first person whose hand landed on the trunk said, this being is like a thick snake. For another one whose hand reached its ear, it seemed like a kind of fan. As for another person whose hand was upon its leg, the elephant is a pillar like a tree trunk. The blind man placed his hand upon its side and said that the elephant is a wall. Another felt its tail, described it as a rope. The last man felt its tusk, stating that the elephant is that which is hard, smooth, and like a spear. In some versions, the blind men then discover their disagreements and suspect that the others to be not telling the truth. The stories also differ primarily in how the elephant's body parts are described, how violent the conflict becomes, and how or if the conflict among the men and their perspectives is resolved. In some versions, they stop talking. In other versions, they start listening and collaborating to see the full elephant. In another, a sighted man enters the parable, and he describes the entire elephant from various perspectives. The blind men then learn that they were all partially correct and partially wrong. This parable is so symbolic today because while one subjective experience is true, it may not be the totality of truth. Hansi and I dive in further to explore this theme. Please note that I interviewed Hansi over one year ago in July of 2020, but what we discuss here is still very pertinent today. In this interview, we talk about Hansi's six types of politics, the need to adopt a more holistic or metamodern worldview, how our subjective experiences are an important part of the metamodern perspective, the difference between light depth and dark depth, and why light depth is a profoundly playful position and dark depth is profound seriousness, and why both of these are true. We also discuss why you can out-depth your partner and what you can do about it, if anything. The importance of integrating the part of yourself that's seeking a specific level of depth from a romantic partner. 
and why not all people can become metamodernists. This is a great episode, and if you enjoy this podcast, I would so appreciate seeing a five-star review on Apple Podcast. So please go to Apple Podcasts and leave a review, and I will be glad to give you a shout out in my next episode. Speaking of which, this review came in from Jeremiah Abrams. He writes, a mystical sister in muse. Jessica Ann is a great interviewer, a good listener, does her homework, and anticipates her guests' direction and thoughts with uncanny skill. Almost any guest appearance will reveal her skill set. I especially enjoyed her time with Eric Davis and talks with Jeff Brown. Illuminating. Thank you for this podcast. Thank you so much, Jeremiah Abrams. These are really challenging times right now, and I love working with my clients to activate their voice, amplify their message, and bring that more human element into the marketing. If you're feeling challenged in your role as a leader in this new paradigm, my one-on-one mentorship program may be right for you. I invite you to reach out to me to learn more and see if you may be a good fit for this kind of support. You can follow Art of Humanity on Instagram at AOH Podcast, or you can direct message me on IG or Twitter at beingishuman, or shoot me an email at hello at jessicaannmedia.com. Thank you so much for listening. Let's go to the show. Welcome to The Art of Humanity, where we explore creativity and consciousness with artists, leaders, authors, and entrepreneurs. Today, I am so thrilled to be joined by Hansi Frenacht. Hansi is a political philosopher, historian, and sociologist, author of The Listening Society, Nordic Ideology, and the book, The Six Hidden Patterns of World History. As a writer, Hansi combines in-depth knowledge of several sciences and disciplines and offers maps of our time and the human condition with his characteristically accessible, poetic, and humorous writing style, challenging the reader's perspective of herself and the world. He epitomizes much of the meta-modern philosophy and can be considered a personification of this strand of thought. So Hansi, thank you so much for joining me on The Art of Humanity. The pleasure is on my side. (laughs) Let's preface this by saying that my audience is super smart, but they may not necessarily have a PhD in philosophy or politics. So let's just make sure that we don't go too far into jargon before we get to dive in deeper. Makes perfect. So I'd love to begin with the beginning of your story. And we can get into theories that you bring up in your book and Ken Wilber and metamodernism and all the flaws in spiral dynamics aka the weeds of all of this, in a bit. And we may jump around a bit, but I'd love to start at the heart of it all. Mm. We share a similar narrative in that we both kind of share this tempered rage against modern life. And we believe that it's not good enough. We want more. We Mm. demand more. We have higher potential. And this is called The Listening Society, which is the title of your incredibly profound book. The full title is The Listening Society, A Meta-Modern Guide to Politics. So I'd love to start in your earlier years where this raid kind of all began. And I know the irony is that it it began in India when you were meditating, as I've heard you mention in some of your other interviews that you've recorded. I'm curious, kind of take me back to that time in your 20s and how did meditation shape you and enable you to write the concepts in your books? So great question. And I wouldn't necessarily say that the rage began in India. And I'd also like to qualify rage there, that there is a sense of moral insufficiency or deficiency of modern life and modernity and everyday life and the games of everyday life, as it were. And even if you grow up in a free society and you have privileges and you can go about your business, you have liberty to not be stuck in the tyranny of cousins of more closely knit communities and traditionalist cultures, there is still something lacking a a lot of the time. And there are profound meaning-making structures that just aren't really there. And many people manage still to live out their lives and not really be bothered by this. But I'm a minority, and I believe, and I can see also a growing minority of people kind of outgrow modern culture, kind of feel at home in it, but still increasingly feel it's a prison. For myself, you mentioned going back to my young adulthood, I had a significant period of several years of being on a surface level functional, but feeling as if I was living in a dream somehow that everyday life didn't quite feel real. 
I felt a sense of anxiety that followed me around. And of course, then a guilt kind of creeps up on you that if you're just going to keep living your life, first of all, you don't see a path or I didn't see a pathway for uh, fulfillment and happiness for myself. But beyond that, even if I could do that, I would feel guilty that I was reproducing a society that I didn't fundamentally believe in, that I felt was alienating, that even if I happen to get out of it, then other people might not. If I have children, for instance, I will be bringing them up into a society I don't quite believe in. Yeah. I'm sure many of my listeners may be able to relate to that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. These things are, can, can be so subtle. So you walk around and you're perhaps superficially happy, but at the same time, you're suffering on a deeper level. It's more like it's something is chafing. That's the word, I think. And, yes. and, and then there's kind of a knot in your heart, or there was in mine anyway that showed up in close romantic relationships and just kind of the enthusiasm for life, the spark for life, which is weird when you have all these opportunities and possibilities and so on. And just like the games of everyday life that you notice that underneath there are a bunch of pretty exclusionary power games going on. You don't really want to be part of it. You want to resist it somehow. And that, of course, not of course, but for me, that got me interested in sociology and psychology and politics and looking around for perspectives I would believe in. So the political perspectives, there were those left and right and uh, green and uh, conservative and radical conservative, and none of them seemed quite true. I mean, you may pick up a little bit here and there. Libertarians are interesting in their ways. Left-wing critique is interesting. But nothing that would serve as a real compass for a real moral compass and a real project for my life that would feel transcendent, that would feel like it was worth the rest of my lifetime. Yeah, and that makes um, a lot of sense. I guess that's where India and so on comes in that I figure that maybe I can get rid of my anxieties if I work really hard through them uh, with serious meditation, which I was aware of was a thing. So I did go to India. I did go to a bunch of Vipassana retreats. I studied Tibetan Buddhism. Well, did what a lot of Westerners do. I mean, I wasn't necessarily convinced by Buddhist and uh, Vedic philosophy, but I did see that I was offered tools for relating inner layers of myself. And these tools may as well have been offered to me much, much earlier. And I could have avoided perhaps many years of rather severe suffering if I had been taught these things at an earlier stage. Not only mm. that, I felt there was something that had been missing, namely this identification that I got to practice through meditation, to think thoughts and see them as beautiful shapes, or not so beautiful sometimes, that surface from a profound depth that I can't see the bottom of, and then through associations, creating new patterns, new patterns, and I am not that, or I am that, but I'm so many other things as well. I'm on a more uh, real level. I am the very depths from which these thoughts emerge. So you start mm -hmm. to disidentify with your truths and your thought patterns and your values and your ideas, a sense of identity. And I felt, aha, uh -huh, if I can disidentify more with particular political ideology, for instance, then they somehow start making more sense because then I can be more secure in the struggle to do something good or the playful struggle to do something good because I know that it's not just an identity project, which is kind of what <laughs> I felt was wrong with the different political parties, for instance, that, well, you were expected to put on this identity and then follow a certain mold and then identify with it. And even idealistic anarchists, for instance, would seem somehow insincere. Mm -hmm, totally. And so I figured, well, to unlock this truth-seeking potential, we would need to collectively train these inner qualities or these inner capacities of, well, busting our own bullshit and disidentifying with our thoughts, feelings, and ideas. Mm -hmm. and around the same time, then, I came across integral theory and other holistic perspectives and map making of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, before we get into integral theory, I definitely want to go in that direction. But if it's okay, I'd love to just stop you right there. 
So you mentioned that you kind of went to India to find a different identity or something that wasn't available in the West. And you use the term, there was a deep alienation. And in your book, you describe that you are looking for the sense of uniqueness that grows from this alienation. Alienation makes you miserable. So you have a pervasive sense that there must be something wrong. And it becomes important to prove that we are unique. And then you quote Rousseau, who says, if I am not better, at least I am different. So correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, going to India and doing these Vipassana meditations, it's like the first step removed or it's the first step to get to postmodernism where you disidentify from culture. We're no longer in creative opposition to nature, but rather in creative opposition to culture. So can you just outline, I guess, that first step to believing or to identifying with the disidentification? It's kind of a paradox here, but you begin to kind of peel back the layers of yourself to realize that we are all in these meat suits and we put on these different identities, whether they're political in nature, whether they're spiritual in nature, like we start to just peel back the onions of our souls to get to that next step. So, and authenticity becomes super important. And this is the postmodernist stage, which you refer to in your book as POMO. And how does all of that kind of tie into that natural growth or that natural human evolution that some of us may be experiencing, where we're all kind of awakening at different times in, in our lifetimes and we are trying to peel back our own souls and excavate what's below? Hmm. So development tends to be relatively uneven. So for me, given that I had already been so exposed to a lot of thoughts and ideas and was already a fairly complex thinker, I wouldn't necessarily say that opened me up to postmodernism. It was perhaps just the last pieces of the puzzle that I needed to adopt a more holistic or integral or metamodern worldview, I would say, rather. That being said, there is a profound connection between what's often viewed as, uh, it's often described as postmodern philosophy, which has to do with demasking power structures, with understanding the importance of context, with seeing that there are structures of thought which are not our own. The postmodern philosophers, they went ahead and said they had killed the author, for instance, and books were writing themselves essentially. And they picked apart culture and they picked apart our participation in culture and saw that it's a machine out there. There is something very parallel in that and Eastern philosophy and spiritual practice, which picks apart the self. And almost as if there were two sides of the same coin, you notice there is an emptiness or void around which all of these thought patterns and identifications exist. And this void is infinitely larger and that the thought patterns and identifications and sense of self and our desires are very arbitrary. And that can be excruciating and it can uh, leave us disoriented. But at the same time, it's also a path to liberation or a path to emancipation where you can reach deeper and beyond the confines of a certain identity, of a certain personhood, of a certain time and culture, for instance. And you can begin to look into the cracks or begin to see culture from the outside or see your construction of a cell from the outside. Some people have called this being construct aware. Some people have called it social constructionism. And there is a close connection or a parallel between the deconstruction of reality and culture that had the West and the deconstruction of self that was already ongoing in the Eastern traditions. If you look at the etymology of the word culture, it has the word cult in it. Mm -hmm. Once I found that out, I just never could see culture in the same way again. And it's always like, I want to kind of try to see what I can do or collectively see what we can do to remove ourselves from the culture while creating the new culture, which you talk about in your book. So yeah, I just wanted to go off tangent a little bit right there. But yeah, it's really just about trying to stimulate development into these higher stages at the same time, trying to manage the ongoing relations between these existing stages. Taking a leap to the next one, around the same time I discovered, because I had been looking around also academically, I had been studying law and been studying economics, philosophy, and uh, and sociology, of course. And within sociology, I remember I wrote about urban development and stuff like that. And within sociology, I was looking for a perspective that I really liked that felt true and comprehensive somehow. And I was aware that there seemed to be severe limitations to all of the major perspectives in sociology. And yet 
they seem to fit together somehow. Uh, around this time, then, I started figuring, maybe there's a pathway here for me. Maybe I can create some kind of map about how these fit together. Turns out other people had the same thought or the same idea and had done already lifetimes of work there. It just wasn't represented within academia for many different reasons. One of them is perhaps that the time for these ideas hadn't yet come. Another part was that these writers were so experimental and didn't fit the academic mold and didn't play by those rules. And I figured maybe I shouldn't either, actually. So among them was Ken Wilber and also a lot of other spiritual authors, I suppose. And I began to see that there are really powerful maps with which you can fit together other perspectives non-arbitrarily. And then you can traverse those different perspectives in a much more nimble and creative and innovative manner. And that's kind of what led me to the path. That, so maybe the political projects of the future should be using such maps of reality, comprehensive maps of the different perspectives that we have, of the different forms of sociological thinking, of the different forms of economic thinking, of combining natural and social sciences, and combining these with phenomenological studies, meaning studies of the first person or direct experience, such as in meditation. And, of course, reflections on that same personal experience, which is more in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy of different sorts, whether more somatic or more analytical, did seem to fit together. And I thought, wait a minute, why isn't society already designed in a way that works across all of these different perspectives? Yeah, totally. I'm just blown away, too, because when reading your book, I was thinking the same thing. It's these maps, like there are these maps and they are philosophical and they do talk about theory. But at the same time, maps you can actually apply. It's raw data from the real world. And then we can apply it through using Ken Wilber's integral theory. So I think a lot of people maybe in the world may see integral theory or even the word theory of itself as non-applicable to real life. But it doesn't mean just talking about stuff. It means seeing stuff and then using those ideas to take shape. So that shape in your head is going to cover what you see, feel and do. And then you have perception and action. So, you know, when people hear the word theory, I think some people may see it as, oh, there's just a disconnect that's just theoretical fluff. But then other people, as you describe in your book, and Ken Wilber describes, it provides a roadmap to live this new life. So it just blows me away sometimes that we've been alive for so long, yet there's just so many paths that we have yet to uncover and so many trails that we have left to see. And we're, we're paving them right now, as you describe in your book. So I just wanted to stop you there because I too am blown away that there aren't more people applying these theories to real life. And I think that integral theory is just a huge step in that right direction. So if you could just take a step back and maybe explain integral theory a little bit, just really high level. Yes, actually, I could start with just saying a few words about theory in general. So that theory means seeing from Greek. And if we consider examples in the world, Marxist theory took over literally a third of the world for a while. And it turned out to be partly flawed. A hundred million lives lost later, uh, humanity has learned its lesson. And we can still learn, of course, from the theory, but it's followed to a lesser degree. On the other hand, there are theories that have been applied and have worked, such as, let's say, Montesquieu's idea of tripartite division of powers, which is the hallmark of all democracies in the world. And if we think about that, it's apparent that theory has also saved very many lives and prevented many instances of torture and oppression, for instance. So theory really, really, really matters. We all live within theories whether or not we see it that way. And um, integral theory, which inspired me a lot, has a few different, basically has two basic properties. One is the meta maps that I was talking about. And I know a lot of listeners and readers are confused about the word map because maps should be drawn. But why do you have to draw maps? You might as well write maps. If what you're mapping is a little bit more complex than you can put on two dimensions on a piece of paper, then sometimes it's better to write the map, meaning it's still a shape in our mind and it helps us find our way in the world and perceive the world and interpret it. 
But it's described, if it's more complex, maybe better interconnected chapters which present ideas and then interconnect those ideas and then connect them back to reality. So that's what I mean when I say map. I know it's worth clarifying that. So anyway, integral theory has these two things. It's one thing are these meta maps. How do different sciences and spirituality fit together, basically? And the second part is that it has a developmental perspective, meaning the maps that we have of the world and how we understand ourselves, each other, our ethics, how we treat each other. And the reality of the world around us relies on how we have developed as human beings. So there is a psychology of philosophy, as it were. I'll say that again, a psychology of philosophy. So different people have different philosophies, life philosophies, theories about life and our place in it. But there is a psychology behind that, a psychology of personality in part, but also a developmental psychology, a psychology that if you develop as a human being, you tend to shift your perspective in non-arbitrary ways. More specifically, your perspective tends to become less black and white, more nuanced. It tends to be able to bridge what was bridge and synthesize and coordinate what was formerly viewed as opposites or uh, irreconcilable opposites. And it tends to be better at taking more perspectives. And it tends to be better at coordinating more perspectives. And once you do so, your own perspective tends to change. Mm. So those are two key ideas, the meta maps themselves, the maps of other theories or other ways of viewing life, and this developmental psychology, which depends also on the society you live in, which affects how each of us spontaneously begin to relate to life and understand our place in it. Totally. Yeah. So it's less judgmental and it seeks to integrate elements from all of the former ones and it sees partial truths in all of them. And that is part of the metamodern value meme, which is a little bit of a paradox because when you exist in this place where you are not judging, the people who are judgers who may be in the modernist realm or the postmodernist realm may see you as not having a North Star because you're not taking sides. Right. So how do you explain this to someone who hasn't read your book or may not be a metamodernist or even a postmodernist? How do you explain the cultivation of all of the perspectives into one without seeing like you're just floating off into space, without it seeming like we're just floating off into space and that there is a real map that we are hardwired into. And just coming from a place of having empathy from people who may be hearing this and saying like, how do you do that? How is that possible? And for some people that might not even be possible to embody or to encapsulate that idea, but can you do your best to describe that non-judgmental territory of the map? Yes, and I think you really hit the nail on the head with the word non-judgmental there because it's kind of the core value of a metamodern philosophy is non-judgment or non-judgment and acceptance really are core values together with truth-seeking. And the most common accusation leveled against metamodernists and integralists who have this developmental view that there are profound qualitative shifts of perspective and relatedness to the world, which are possible and which can be ranked in a developmental stage theory, is that it's arrogant and that it is judgmental, that it would see some people as higher standing than others. And some people has more developed or better or more loved by God, even in the last instance, right? And the answer to that is actually, no, it's the other way around. If you view the world developmentally, it means that everybody is who they are for good reasons. And everybody has the right to be who they are because they couldn't be anybody else. And they didn't make a choice before they were born to be born into a certain culture with a certain set of privileges and a certain developmental trajectory and so on. So when you hear, I don't know, people who strongly disagree with uh, Trump supporters defending white nationalism, for instance, you don't hear a moral degenerate and you don't hear a person who is willingly taking a stance against sound judgment and morality. 
you hear somebody else who life placed in another position and on another trajectory and who embodies those values that they were brought up with and expresses how life looks and feels like from their position in society and from their developmental stage. And that helps you to actually not judge the other person. And it helps you to ask the right questions, namely, what would this person need or want to hear or have fulfilled in terms of other needs in order to advance their perspective? And and sometimes you'll find that other people have a more advanced perspective on any topic. And then you can figure out, well, what prevented me from seeing this truth that formerly was inaccessible to me? And oftentimes it will be that the other person perhaps had more profound spiritual experiences, that they had better education, that they had better contacts in their life that brought other ideas and opened their minds in ways that wasn't open to me. So the developmental ladder of psychology and of society is less arrogant because it doesn't assume that I myself at the highest stage, there is always something beyond me. And there are always going to be arguments that I haven't thought about that would basically turn my world upside down and that would make me reconsider everything and take a radically different perspective. And the main difference then between people who take a developmental stance and people who don't is that the people who do have often had the experience in their adult life. Everybody has this as a kid that your worldview radically expands and you see the world in completely new ways. But to a minority of people, this happens also in adult life, that you can see that from the logic that I was following, brought to its own pinnacle, it collapsed on itself and led to radically different conclusions than I had expected. And this can happen through spiritual growth. It can happen through the integration of trauma through therapy or just by making friends with your family and friends over sensitive topics. It can happen by learning a new field. It can happen by encountering a new culture. It can happen through life experience and going through a crisis. Totally. And the people who have this, they know intuitively that, aha, there are different stages of development. I used to see the world that way. Now I can see that position, as it were, from the up from above. I can see it as if I was walking around on a two-dimensional plane, and I can now see through all of the thoughts and ideas and values and desires that I had at an earlier point. Mm, yeah, I love that. And I think it's important to give examples of these different hierarchical models. And that's really one of the biggest themes of your book, You describe the model of hierarchical complexity, which the acronym is MHC. And you go through all the different stages of complexity in your book. And when I got to the part where you were describing the Faustian theory, I remember specifically, and I'll give an example for listeners to help provide some context to this because it's easy to get kind of caught in the weeds here. One of the Faustian ways of thinking is an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind. And I remember when I was a kid coming across this quote and loving it and like being like just I had a fire inside of me after reading this quote. And I can look back in retrospect and see how that just a mere quote or words or inspiration of some sort of some philosopher can help you get out of your own way and get out of your own bubble. So that's an example of a Faustian philosophy way of looking at the world. Can you really briefly, because it's really deep and complex, the different stages, but in your book, you go through stage 12, 13, and there's all these different stages. If you can maybe give like a really short example or analogy of the different stages of human development so that listeners may have some context as to exactly how MHC operates. By all means, I'll just first start with a small comment that what you mentioned was post-Faustian. So Faustian would be more, let's say, a Bronze Age mentality where an eye for an eye is indeed the order of the day and a value. And you will have maybe several gods. You will have war gods, for instance. And thus you do find eye for an eye in the early parts of the Old Testament. And then once you get to the New Testament, which is patently post-Faustian, kind of like there was modern and postmodern. There was Faustian religion and then post-Faustian reformations of those religions. 
then you get to an eye for an eye leaves the whole world blind or turn the other cheek or uh, might does not make right and so on. Only the truth will set you free. There was a huge revolution about 2,500 years ago, which is today called the Axial Age, where this post-Faustian awareness came to, well, all the big civilizations, really. But about MHC and about the stages of complexity, I have studied personally with the inventor of the theory, Lambert Commons. He's not very much like you and me, not the spiritual type at all. He's more like behaviorist, crude, reductionist, materialist kind of thinker. And he's a mathematician applying his skills to behavioral psychology. And he built this theory on a very well-known theory people, that anybody who studied educational science, they will have come across, or psychology for that, they will have come across the developmental stages in children of Jean Piaget. And the basic idea then that the post-Piagetians had, those that built on the work of Jean Piaget, who would study these major qualitative shifts of the minds in, of children, and they said, wait a minute, does this development stop? Once somebody has reached the rational thinking of an adult human being and then everybody's the same? Or are there different stages among adult human beings? Is there adult development of the complexity of your mind? And of course, they devise a bunch of different psychometric devices for measuring this. Moral reasoning tests, mathematical reasoning tests, anything you can think of really, pricing tests even. And they did see that there does consistently show up a few different stages in adult human beings. And some stages are common and many people reach them. Some stages are rare and are reached by few people. So there appear to be a minority of adult people who have somewhat more complex minds, not meaning that they're right about any particular topic or that they will think more complexly on anything they approach but that when they concentrate and when they work long and hard on something, they will be able to come up with more complex forms of reasoning. And the basic principle would be then that each stage of complexity coordinates the mental operations of the former stage. So it's kind of like you're adding dimensions. You go from just drawing a line to drawing a square to drawing a cube to drawing a hypercube. And a hypercube is a four-dimensional object and you can pull an, a cube out of its middle and you can do it again and again. It will just turn around. And at least when it's projected on a three-dimensional surface, as it were. And the stages of complexity are kind of like that. You're adding a dimension to your thinking. Well, many people will reach the stage of uh, formal reasoning when they can take uh, different abstract variables in their minds and they can draw a formal relation between them. They can make an equation, I suppose. And the equation might be, if I do more of this, I get more of that. Hence, I should maximize how much I do A to get more B. And then you have a strategy for that, for instance. Mm, I find it interesting, just skipping ahead a little bit, I really found it interesting that when you talked about the stage, you haven't listed the numbers yet, but stage 13 is a little bit of a higher level. It's metasystematic. And you mentioned that it's less than 2% of the normal adult population right. is able to, as you described it, add dimension to your thinking. So this system or metasystematic way of thinking has a really high dimensional cognitive functioning in this world. And it's only 2% of the normal adult population how do you come up with these numbers? I know that people with strong spiritual experiences are quite rare, but how did you determine that 2% of the adult population is able to achieve this level? So one of the main points in my book is that I detach cognitive development, which is basically just the patterns of your thoughts from spiritual development. So we actually don't really know how these correlate very much. We know that uh, spiritual experiences are fairly rare, and we also know that complex thoughts are fairly rare. And it's the 2% just comes out of uh, Michael Commons's psychometric tests. So you will set up reasoning tests where you do different t trivial tasks, and then he will assess how you reason, not necessarily if you got the right answer. And yeah, the tests are specifically set up to see how the complexity of your reasoning leads to different kinds of answers. And in those tests, it's pretty consistent that it's less than 2%, somewhere slightly less than 2% who uh, reason at metasystematic. 
So the stage I mentioned before is called formal, formal logic. And above that is majority of adult human beings reach formal logic. And above that, there is systematic logic. You can put different formal equations together into a system. You can compare them and connect them. And that's about 20% of the population. And then you can compare and contrast and work your way through and past different systems. And that's metasystematic. And you just having learned this theory then opens up kind of a world of listening to people and hearing what kind of reasoning are they partaking in? What's the structure of their reasoning? And a lot of times you will hear academics making an argument and the argument will be one kind of consistent system maybe entirely within the Marxist view, for instance, or entirely within a capitalist view, or entirely within an ecological systems view, for instance. And they will tend to have answers to life's questions that are at the systematic stage. And a small minority will work their way across and coordinate different such systems. And those are metasystematic people. Got it. Yeah. So it really adds different layers to it. And I love how at the very end of your book, because as you're writing directly to your reader and people who are reading your book want to identify as one of the higher colors, turquoise and the spiral dynamics, which really coming across like holier than thou, like I can see all of the spectrums below me and I'm able to integrate them. But you also mentioned that just because you have a high state and great depth does not mean you are a complex thinker and that you have access to advanced symbolic code. And you say death to turquoise, which if my listeners don't know what this is, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but I just love this because it really shows that there's so much more that we don't even know or see. So it's so easy to get wrapped up into identifying with the turquoise version of spiral dynamics and to think that you're better than all the other colors. And then, wait, there's just a different level or there's a different, and you may not even have access to advanced symbolic code Can you break that down a little bit to listeners who may have no idea what even talking about? And I know we kind of jumped ahead a lot, but I love this part of your book and because it really breaks it down in a really simple way. And I hope we can kind of stay at that level as you describe this, all these details. (laughs) Oh, thank you. So the idea in Spiral Dynamics is that they have found roughly the same stages actually as Michael Commons is complexity theory. But they mix in other things that have to do with the development of your personality, your values, and your spirituality. So the model gets a bit cluttered, basically. And they argue that first you get to modern, or first you get to traditional religion, like being a traditional Christian, for instance, and they call that blue, and maybe believing dogmatically in that religion. And then you get to orange, and that's a rational modern life. And then you get to postmodern or green, and then that's being part of the counterculture, being left-wing intellectual, being literary critic, and so on. Maybe an environmentalist or feminist for that matter. And then beyond that, they posit at least two stages. So one would be yellow, which would equate with metamodernism, which I think comes after postmodernism. And then they had another one, turquoise, which they describe as very holistic, very spiritual, and with a profound sense of wholeness and love of all the former perspectives and an embodied all of those former perspectives. Now, I don't disagree with that general direction. Yes, I think we're going towards some kind of softer, not necessarily here and now in this historical moment, but on our longer uh, developmental journey, it does seem to be pointing towards some kind of sense of wholeness with the biosphere as a whole, with the cosmos as a whole, with a disentification of the self, with profound perspective taking, which helps us to recreate our own perspective and integrate learnings from, from, for instance, traditional religions, from endogenous cultures and so on. The problem is that we are, as a culture, you need specific code systems, you need philosophies to back all of these different developmental stages up for them to materialize in society in a productive and non-pathological, meaning a healthy way. And given that we are right now at a moment in history where postmodern theory and thinking 
and postmodern values have grown strong, and they are only beginning to break apart and be criticized by metamodern ideas, such as integral theory and growth and meta maps, including spiritual dimensions or re including them and ranking all of the different perspectives that you picked apart in postmodern mindset, coordinating them non arbitrarily and finding embodied ways of working with them. So we have the critique of the postmodern worldview, but per definition, each such stage should rip apart the symbols and values and logics of the former. So at least from my view, I am not aware of philosophy that is growing on top of the metamodern philosophy or the integral philosophy that would do the same to that kind of philosophy. And if you think about it, it doesn't make sense that it would exist because the metamodern philosophy hasn't played out in the world yet. It hasn't become dominant in any setting I can think of. It is only germinating. It's only in its early formulations. It has uh, very, very few adherents. And there are no applications of it worth mentioning anywhere in the world. So how could there be a large philosophical critique from uh, hundreds or thousands of people who already are alienated by modern, metamodern society and start picking that apart? So it appears from my perspective that we must here be jumping the gun and maybe projecting wishes onto a future developmental stage, which we can intuit in our spiritual practices and so on. But it doesn't quite make sense to believe in it as a force in society, at least not a healthy force. What I see, though, uh, happening to a lot of people who uh, identify strongly with the turquoise stage is that they tend to retract to a dogmatic religion of sorts. And you have the appearances of cults of different shapes and sizes. You have blind guru worship and followership. You have, well, direct rebirths of dogmatic, non-rational and pre-rational thought or uh, beliefs of traditional religions in this particular group. Absolutely. And the recognition of mystery is, it may be the most accepted and encouraged form of depth development in modern society. And I love that you tie in mystery with depth development Mm -hmm. because it's something that is indirectly applicable Yet directly applicable. It's like a paradox in and of itself because, you know, we're trying to latch onto these new roots on these maps and then you're throwing in this word mystery. Like we all have this collective definition of mystery, but mystery can be defined in so many different ways. So can you describe how and why the recognition of mystery is the most accepted and encouraged form of depth development in modern society? Right. So I should first say a few words about depth development So in the book, I talk about four different forms of development. We have mentioned, or two of them, we have mentioned the development of complexity of thoughts, which doesn't have to do so much with who you are spiritually. We have, I wouldn't say thoughts, the complexity of cognitive operations that you're um, capable of. We have then a second dimension, which is cultural code, which is only developed collectively, really. I mean, the cultural code we download from our society, as it were. So we live in a modern society, we get the modern code. We live in a medieval society, we get the medieval code, or the, what I would call the post-Faustian code. And then we have two more interior or um, softer forms of development. One is state, meaning like which spiritual states do we access? And this goes both upwards and downwards. So we can access, we can have a brief taste of heaven, or we can have a visceral recognition of the existence of hell, for instance. And we can remember that, and that can drive us. And in every given moment, we are in some kind of subjective state. And some lucky few are in high subjective states and spiritual states often or a lot of the time and have very, very little anxiety and a great clarity and compassion that flows spontaneously from these higher states. And that, of course, correlates with having a more later stage development in terms of uh, worldview and so forth. It correlates, but doesn't define it. And then depth is the fourth one. And depth is when we look in the eyes of someone, sometimes you can notice this, that people who are spiritual practitioners, and let's say you go to a yoga parlor, people will have these soft eyes. And if you look deep in their eyes, they will keep looking and you kind of see how their eyes open up as tunnels. 
And you'll know that they have done a lot of inner work. They will have worked through profound traumas. They will have, I don't know, gone on psychedelic trips. They will have been in profound meditation trances. They will perhaps have had uh, tantric sexual experiences, which opened up their hearts. They will have practiced perhaps compassion and had felt like profound warmth in their heart when they engage in helping the suffering. So that's what I'm looking for when I talk about depth. It appears to be a development, a certain kind of development, which is not reducible to whichever state you happen to be in at the moment. Because even if you fall down to a lower state and you're having a bad day, the depth is still there. You still remember that suffering. You still remember that bliss and it still drives you. And there is that relatedness. And if you out in depth your surroundings, then you tend to feel very, very lonely. You want to feel met in those profound depths that you have discovered within yourself and in reality. Now, depth comes in different shapes and sizes or in different forms. I mentioned compassion already and leading heart or the broken heart of the saint. But there's not only that, there's aesthetic depth. So being in love with life, seeing the beauty of it, the cosmo-erotic relationship to existence, the depth of the artist. And then there is the third kind of depth, depth in the third person, depth vis-a-vis -vis objective reality, or depth in the face of science, in the depth of knowing and knowledge, meaning mystery, really. All the sciences flow from the capacity to see and perceive a certain mystery in the world. So biology is born at the moment people become aware of the question, what is life? And once they are capable of waking up to that mystery, biology is born. Before that, biology doesn't exist as a science. Sociology shows up when the mystery is born in someone's heart. What is society? I never saw it. I just took it for granted. But it is something. What is the human soul? Psychology is born. And subjective experience plays such a huge role in identifying yet not identifying with all of these different spectrums, correct? Correct. Yeah. And to answer your initial question, um, that why is mystery the most accepted form of depth? Well, because our society is, of course, obsessed with science and objective knowing and rationality. So the depth that Richard Dawkins presents or uh, Carl Sagan present when they describe how science has opened their eyes to the beauty of the universe, then they are drawing on this kind of depth and it should not be overlooked and it can be a profound source also of depth development. Mm, I love that. Yeah, and I love how you describe the cosmoerotic relationship to the artist. I, I think that's really brilliantly put, the cosmoerotic relationship to the artist. And your subjective experience became a part of my subjective experience last night while I was finishing your book, The Listening Society, while listening to a song that you mentioned in your book, Una Matina. Mm -hmm. I pulled up the song because I wanted to make your subjective experience part of my experience, even though you are halfway around the globe. And, you know, I was watching the full moon in the distance come up over San Francisco, and I couldn't help but feel the restructuring take place, the restructuring that you talk about, the very ideals that you discuss. And I felt spontaneously at home with the ideas presented in your book. You know, they're baked in science and baked in theory, whereas completely alone in the herd. So, you know, metamodernism is the ability to kind of feel connected without really knowing you. And this is really the essence of what's emerging here. This is where we're at. And this is a very simplistic way of describing the rich, intricate nuances of metamodernism. But I think it's important to help kind of bring in perspectives and examples and contexts. And this just may be my personal mental masturbation with your words on a screen. But, uh, you know, I just, I felt such a deep poetic love and joy for the words that you bring to this world, even though I may not understand all the nuances of everything you mentioned, because I'm not a trained philosopher and I don't have the background 
I definitely can feel the essence of what you're trying to bring to this world or what you are bringing to this world. We're removing ourselves and extricating ourselves from the old paradigm and building a new paradigm. And it's a beautiful distinction. So thank you so much for bringing this to the world. And, and I just thank you for introducing me to such a beautiful song. Um, it really is powerful and heartbreakingly poetic. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. And I, I think um, there's just so much depth to the work that you're bringing. I'm just out of curiosity. Curious, you mentioned different states, the low states and the higher states in your book. And Dr. David Hawkins is one of my favorite teachers. And you'd mentioned different states. Have you integrated any of Hawkins' map of consciousness into your work? I'll be frank about uh, my own assessment of Hawkins' work that I think it gets too woo-woo, unfortunately, and that he makes too wild claims, basically. And I don't mention him particularly in the book, but he's one of the many thinkers that I try to navigate with this kind of map that, aha, you have a high-depth, high-state thinker. He knows a lot of code also, but in terms of the complexity of the theory, it tends to get a bit flat. And for this reason, there are uh, pressures that arise, which invite different kinds of magical thinking and different kinds of wishful thinking, I suppose. That being said, yes, there is a clear parallel between his scale of states and my own. His richer and has more in it. Mine is uh, simpler and has less in it. At the same time, I think given that any description of the inner states and the inner landscapes are pretty speculative at the time, we don't even know with which scientific method we could approach them. It makes sense to be a little bit more cautious in describing the, these scales. I just suggest 13 steps and he has a wider scale. Mm, got it. Yeah, that makes sense. I know you criticize Eckhart Tolle's work and and I, do, I totally can see why I never really resonated with his work for the reasons that you list in your book. But at the same time, I guess there are different teachers at different stages. And Dr. Hawkins is one of many different teachers who embody spiritual teachings. I totally see why he's kind of along the same lines, I guess, of an Eckhart Tolle, I guess, as you articulate in your book. Mm. I mean, particularly, I have a problem, I suppose, with this notion that you can assess the energy levels of things by your own subjective experience. I think it's better to own that this is your own subjective experience and that you're not necessarily channeling another truth than your own. I think that's yeah. an important part of the metamodern perspective that I guess also a part of the critique against how turquoise levels of consciousness or stages of consciousness are often described, that you can sense these deeper energies and so on. I feel that opens up to projections that our own mind sneaks around in the background and actually makes its own assessment and self-knowledge then and shared self-knowledge that I open you up with uh, critique and, of course, support and, of course, open and then uh, vice versa. You open me up with critique and support. And then we kind of democratize spirituality and make it somehow a little bit more tangible, making it come out in the world, as it were, a little bit more. There's a lot of thinking about what kind of theology this would lead to, but some kind of more headless God with truth is God. And if the truth is always... In what's the word I'm looking for? You can never reach it or it's always bigger. It's inexhaustible. It's an inexhaustible source, really. That means that the new truth that shows up and the deeper truth always kills the old one. <laughs> it's such a refreshing take. It really is because it just goes to show how each book that you read or each new mode of thinking is like a rung on a ladder. And hence the spiral dynamics. It's like a spiral staircase going up to heaven, the universe, whatever the higher power is. And we're just using these new tools or these books or philosophies to kind of step one up, get a step up on these ladders to see our existence in nuanced ways. And I find it really fascinating I think actually uh, it's not a bad way of viewing Jesus like, okay, so we killed Jesus when he showed up, but he was revived three days. So we don't have to be afraid of killing God. It's not like it's going to break. You kill God, crucify him even, and he still shows up three days later because the truth is always larger than any of our thought patterns or even our deepest spiritual experiences, right? Totally. And that brings me to another point that you highlight in your book, talking about the difference between light depth and dark depth. 
when you mention that, there may be people who experience light up, which is a denial of terror. They hear those words you just spoke and you're like, no, I don't want to hear it. Versus dark depth, which is acceptance of terror. And you give examples of a Sue versus Betty. I love this part of your book because especially the part where you go into detail about depth, just because that's kind of my access point at the moment. <laughs> a few months from now or a year from now and cringe seeing how small myopic lens is, but that's where I'm at now. So can you just speak to that difference in the light depth versus the dark depth and how it pertains to how we view reality? Mm, thank you for asking. And also forgot to say, Jessica, thank you for all the kind words you said earlier. I profoundly appreciate it. Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, light depth. Well, so we're back at the yoga parlor or no, we're at Burning Man. And you see a lot of people who have, let's say they open up the hedonic floodgates and got over stuff like shame and inhibition. And they partook in profound, moving, beautiful, eye-opening, highly cosmoerotic experiences. So they maybe experience otherworldly orgasms with their loved ones or just anybody they met, or they had a meditation session which plunged them into an open emptiness which felt like brighter than a thousand suns or something. And then they come back to everyday life and they still have that taste. They still know, wow, that's how lovely existence or reality is. They're never going to forget it. I mean, if their brain collapses or something. But then the person maybe can feel shaken or have a hangover or something afterwards. But they work through that hangover and then they accept the largeness and beauty of existence. And they see how small each of us are. They see the beauty of the stars. They see the depth of uh, historical and cosmological time. And they love it. Now, that is light depth. So if you look in a new age community, people are actually good at cultivating and maintaining and reaching these high depths. It's not always easy. They're often good at that. Now, compare that to, would you say this is a deep person? Yes, you would. This person has a certain kind of quality or depth. Now compare that to, let's say, Kierkegaard, like depressed philosopher with a crumbed back who eats unhealthy and uh, speaks harsh truths, but very incisive and very serious ones. Now, this is also when you read a person like him or Heidegger or, uh, or Nietzsche, you're struck by, well, this person is profound. This is a person who is profoundly, who has wrestled really, really deep and really, really dark demons and is still wrestling them and comes out victorious at times and maybe knows the edge of madness, maybe knows how reality can fall apart, how you can get stuck in loops, like a bad psychedelic trip, for instance, that you just like it's worse than death or suicide or anything else horrible we can think of because there is truly no way out or maybe a torture victim. So there appears to be an eternity of really, really grim suffering. And you understand that, oh, even if I get out of that, there is someone somewhere right now screaming in that expanse of darkness and terror. And of course, terror is the fundamental aspect of it. Pure, pure, pure fear. The people who are on that side, they are also very profound, but they might not even know about the higher peaks of existence. And these two groups will often talk past each other. They both have, have some kind of inner depth, but to the dark depth people, then let's say a Marxist intellectual who smokes and reads literature and poetry, and the new age people will seem insincere. They will mm -hmm. appear hysterical. <laughs> Likewise, to the new agey happy hippies, the others will seem turned away from the world, like they're uh, thinking too much serious thoughts, and they may be. Mm. But they're concerned with preventing suffering. And that's not really the concern you get when you fall really in love with the world. Yes. At least you don't see the seriousness of it. So one side of this that puts you in a profoundly playful position and the other side puts you in a position of profound seriousness. And of course, both of these are true and we develop differently and part by part. Mm -hmm. uh, however, for full spectrum, 
we ideally need to develop both sides, which is horrifying prospect because the dark depths can only really be integrated if we experience the horrors ourselves. Wow, <laughs> that's a really profound way of putting it. I know you're not a relationship coach, but I'm curious. In your book, you mentioned that you can out-depth the person. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to stay in relationships or to have friends that out-depth you or who you out-depth? Or is it a necessary part of enlightenment? Or let me phrase it another way. Does having people who out-depth you, I guess there's a million different ways I could phrase this question, but is it important that you come into relationship with people who are at the same level of depth? Yes and no. It depends. So once you have fully integrated a certain level of depth and you also have good maps of development and you have a rich network of people and settings and practices which you resonate with, then it's not necessary for your soul, as it were, to be met in any particular relationship at that level of resonance, as it were. So if you're on a plateau and you're feeling stable and secure where you are, then just a simple example, people have profound feelings about their kids, but most people will outdepth their own kids. The kids will have a somewhat more superficial view of reality and relatedness to existence, but they're still awesome. We still feel deep connectedness and meaning to and through them. Whereas if you are in a developmental phase where what your soul really wants Maybe you've opened up some depths, but you haven't integrated them yet. And you know that there are somewhere you need to go, something you need to express and explore. And you find a romantic partner and you don't already have many other outlets for it. Then you will naturally look for resonance in this in your romantic partner. Let's say your romantic partner is a lot more mainstream than you are. Then it will likely be a little bit sad for both because one person will try to set something up to relate. It can be uh, through philosophy, through poetry, through sexuality, through uh, artistic experience, and it'll just fall flat on the other person <laughs> who somehow will feel insufficient and will notice the disappointment and the disappointment in a very, very hurtful manner that the, the person is disappointed in your soul and your depth. Well, that doesn't set up for a happy marriage. So it depends. Like if you're in between stage and in a seeking stage when you want to stabilize something deeper and you don't already have outlets for that and you don't have developmental maps with which you can handle or manage your expectations on other people, and then it can be very, very destructive and it can feel profoundly alienating for both parties involved. So I'm hearing that in order to be fulfilled in the relationship, you will need to integrate that part of your soul that's seeking that level of depth in a romantic partner. Yeah. And ideally, then you just lock out and you find a person who brings exactly the kind of depth that you need. So I have a good friend right now, and he was working with depth development and being an intellectual, but also like more on the dark depth side and a little bit miserable. And then he meets this beautiful healer woman and they have tantric sex for hours and he gets hands on Henry healing and well, all of these very subtle energies for lack of a better word. And he's just blown open and she feels that finally a guy who uh, responds when I do this stuff. Of course, they fall very hard in love and they're very happy. So you can luck out. Or you can be unlucky, but it is okay to be at different developmental stages in relationships. And usually you find some kind of stability because developmental stages isn't all there is to life, right? So maybe the other person is really handy or something and you can admire your handyman husband while you have more spiritual depth. And then he just leaves that arena to you, for instance. And that's important because a lot of the times when you are accessing these layers of depth, the practicality of life kind of disappears and you forget to eat or you forget to do basic things in life. So I guess it is about the integration and balancing each other out, whether that's through the light depth meeting, the dark depth or vice versa. I believe so. And I mean, these developmental models that I present 
I mean, they're not about like everybody should be this or should be that. They point in some directions. And then, I mean, I believe that the best that we can do is rather to set up society towards a deeper form of welfare, which creates generative conditions for people to develop these qualities. But then everybody's going to have their own journey and their own trajectory. And then again, there's always more to life than I'm caught in this particular theory, right? Mm -hmm. And an important part that you mention in your book is that not all people can become metamodernists. There's solidarity with all sentient beings also requires solidarity with their perspectives. So being able to function at that high level while still being able to explore the depths and profundities of life is key to all of this. So one last question. I know we're coming up on the hour here, so I wanted to ask you one last question. Is there a theme song that you would use for metamodernist culture, for lack of a better word, metamodernist philosophy or this listening society? I know listening is at the core of your work. And when you listen to music, it nurtures and inspires and uplifts the core of who we are. Is there a song that comes to mind other than the beautiful song that you mentioned in your book? Is there another song that would be the theme song of this new movement? (laughs) I think it's very funny you ask. I mean, I'm experimenting now with upcoming book, Six Hidden Patterns, that chapters get theme songs. But just as there would be no theme song of modernity, there, there, there can't be one of metamodernism either. And that being said, you can still kind of go in a direction here. Like, so, okay, modernity, let's say, would be a theme song of it. Modern life. Well, I would go with Mozart's Ronda La Torca because it has this forward looking, it's very clear, it's very rational in a way, and it's quick and forward looking, and it kind of, you can kind of hear this progression in it. If modernity is about conquering outer space and metamodernity is about conquering inner space or not conquering it, but opening it up, then some kind of soundtrack in that direction, which would speak to that impulse, works. And the first thing that comes to my mind is Hans Zimmer's Time from the movie Inception. I think most people will have heard it. But I know I listened to that writing some of the second book, Nordic Ideology. Fascinating. I love your work and I am uh, really thrilled to have you on The Art of Humanity, Hansi. The pleasure has been mine. Is there anything else you want to add before we go? Just a thank you for your work and for really letting me through. I say a lot of weird things and then your enthusiasm and trust help the words flow through me. So I appreciate that. Thank you.